Moses yen yen wala wala yapun yapush nara pura fera imnaya la nara pura fera imnaya la la nara pura fera imnaya la la nara pura fera imna pura Jesu bradu buken yamana nara pura fera imanaya la nara pura fera imanaya la la nara pura fera imanaya la la nara pura fera imana pura fera imana Um, we're Dear Violet, thanks for having us tonight. That first song we sung was a church hymn that was translated by the Yorta Yorta people from Victoria. And you may have recognised it from the movie The Sapphires. Uh, and this next one we're going to sing is actually an old folk song. Um, best well known by um, Simon and Garfunkel, but it's called Scarborough Fair. <laughs> Oh, God. 
last song we're going to invite Brendan Moore to the stage he's going to accompany us with a bit of ditch um, this song is called Yellow and it sings about the Aboriginal flag Beautiful. So my name is Brendan Moore, I'm a Birupai man from Taree, uh, an Aboriginal Educational Officer for the Royal Botanic Gardens Community Greening Program. Uh, the didgeridoo that I was playing, the Aboriginal name for that instrument is called Yidiki, and I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians, elders, both past and present, and also the Yidiki, where it comes from North East Arnhem Land. I would like to now hand you over to Mr Clarence Lucky. Oh, I feel like I should have run on, but my running days are over. It's just like my dancing days. Oh, I know, Anthea, the older I get, the better I was. Oh, I, this is the trouble with uh, modern society. I don't have a pen, but I will try and keep track, and I'll try and keep everything on, uh, on, on track with this running order that uh, Sophie was so kindly handing to me. I don't know if I'm allowed to share a pen. <laughs> Um, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a pay. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> Anthony and I go way back. <laughs> oh, so we have a, a really interesting panel. You all know why you're here? <laughs> Nervous laugh. You don't know? I do. 
Oh. We're on it. No. We look, we've got, a, we've got a fantastic panel. I should just ask them all to come up, but uh, I've got sheets. I've got all sorts of things going on. I'll get them all to come up, and if they, uh, if they just come up all at the same time, and they, they'll all have their own microphones. It's, you know, no point in me introducing them. It's better that you introduce yourself, don't you think? As they're doing that, I'll just say, you know, my name's Clarence Slocky, and I'm a Bundjalung fella, uh, Minjimbal, Gujumbara, and uh, far north coast, New South Wales. As they say, it's not quite heaven, but it's only a local call away. I <laughs> know. Oh, but there's too many people up there now. That's why I live down this way. Um, <laughs> so, so I've been down here for a while, and... Uh, well, yeah, a long time now. But uh, I've spent uh, many years here at the Botanic Gardens. Love the place, love the people. It's a fantastic uh, scientific research institution. And to introduce us to the Royal Botanic Gardens, we've got uh, Denise Horace sitting over there. Come on. Oh, lovely. I'm going to try and do that. Thank you, Clarence. Um, it's, it's always... I do feel really like this is just too tall. Um, I'm quite loud, so I'm just going to do this. Um, you can't, so though. We're live streaming, Denise. We're live streaming. It's got to go out to the people. OK, I'm moving, moving. Um, OK, I've done it. All right. Um, it's so lovely to see everyone here. Um, and as I say, it's so wonderful, Clarence. We're very um, lucky to have you hosting this amazing event. And you're also very, very lucky to have an incredible panel this evening of just amazing um, business leaders. So I just want to say um, my name is Denise Ora and I'm the Chief Executive of the Royal Botanic Gardens and Domain Trust and also the newly introduced Australian Institute of Botanical Science, which we're really excited about. And um, we've got three amazing gardens, and we also have an incredible domain, which we call Sydney Stage. Um, but I have to, um, as always, acknowledge the traditional custodians, the lands upon which we gather this evening, and where you may all be gathering online, um, and pay respects to the Gadigal people of the Aura Nation, elders past, present, and emerging. And I would like to extend that respect to any um, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people here this evening or in our virtual world, which um, is always really exciting because I love when we can watch these wonderful events back, which is always great. Um, so I also, and I just don't want to get this wrong, but I want to say a big thank you to the sponsors for this incredible event. So we've got the City of Sydney. Um, we also have Foodswell and I also have Sustained. So can we just say a big thank you because we can't do these events without all that help. Um, and so this is um, something I think we need to continue the conversation, understanding the right practices and understanding sustainable practices, but really listening and understanding to those people who know and can lead us in the right way. So welcome to this amazing, and I'll call it the First Nations Enterprise in Conversation and Action. Um, I am really thrilled to be here and I'm really excited to hear the panel. So thank you very much and enjoy the evening. Oh, thank you, Denise. Our panellists are a bit shy. I think they really want me to do a big... Ladies and gentlemen! No, I'm not going to do that. Come on down. Where's Brandon? He's over here. Brandon, Sharon, Chris, come on. See you, buddy. Oh, we've got to have the rose in the middle, Brendan. Come on. Oh, he's right. He's right. <laughs> this chair's too tall for me. We'll start with you then, Sharon. Shall we? Start with me. Yamagata Mayingu, Guni Kanarapa. Hello, welcome. I'm Sharon. I come from where the sun sets in the west, Niamba Nation. I'd like to acknowledge and pay respects to the traditional owners of the land that we're on today. I'd also like to acknowledge and pay respects to my other brothers and sisters that are here today and for everyone who's, who's watching. Welcome. Um, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for hosting this event. It's such a great thing to be happening for our people and for the wider community. Um, I'm... Oh, better tell you what business. Um, I'm Indigiers. I This year I am 25 years in business. 
I met Clarence a long time ago. My dancing days are over to Clarence. <laughs> so um, I actually started out in business in Sydney, in Western Sydney, 25 years ago. I was born in Gunnedah and grew up in between Gunnedah and Coonabarabra, a little place called Rocky Glen. Grew up out in the bush and bush tucker was, was my thing. It was surviving off the land. It was surviving the best we knew how to. But at the time, I didn't know. My parents never told us that we were poor as piss. We didn't know any different. And it was my favourite pastime, going out and collecting bush tucker, going and catching yabbies. When I was little, I used to think goannas were the size of crocodiles and we had to hurry up and get everything before the goannas would eat us and the emus would attack us and all that kind of stuff. So growing up with bush tucker has really been a big part of my life and continues to be a big part of my life. And it's more than just an income for me. It's been my healing through lots of trauma, continues to be my healing. And it's my connection to my culture, it's connection to my spirituality, to language, to everything that surrounds who I am as a proud Aboriginal person. So talking about bush tucker gets me emotional sometimes <laughs> um, because I'm so passionate about it and my journey has been such a different one. When I first started business, 12 months into business, I lost my first child. He was stillborn. I went full term with him. His name is Nakiri which means to give in our language. And then I went on to have two more beautiful children. Kerala means star in our language, and Malian is wedgetail eagle. And I started out doing bush tucker catering here in Sydney, cultural education, traditional dance, and doing lots of different things. And 25 years ago, the thought of bush tucker when you mentioned to someone, they thought you was going to drag a goanna out of the car or it was witchetty grubs. So it was very limited knowledge of what bush tucker was. So there was, it was a really big journey for me to, to push through those barriers and to even get some sort of support. There was no support for Aboriginal people in business 25 years ago. I was working for Centrelink at Mount Druitt 25 years ago. And the, the support I was given was somebody to come out and basically sit down and listen to me about my, my business idea. Don't know how much it cost them for that consultant, but I was basically told, stay in your job. Your business idea will never work. It'll only ever be a hobby, and bush tucker in the industry will never get off the ground. So you can imagine what I've done with that. So, <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Um, I might stop you there. I'll do a Kerry O'Brien. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. you've answered all my questions in oh, one go. Righto. See what happens. I'll move on to Brendan. Stand by. Thanks for sharing. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, again, my name's Brendan Moore. <laughs> Um, I'm a Biripai man from Taree, and uh, uh, the Botanic Gardens, I was an apprentice at the Blue Mountains Botanic Gardens, the, um, which was a beautiful um, spot. Sometimes you forget that you're not actually there to, you know, there to work, but it's kind of like, whoa, you know, you're kind of breathtaking every day. I remember going for a, applying for a position there as an uh, apprentice horticulturalist, and I was, uh, uh, at that time, I was full-time work full-time working at behind a bar in, in uh, Maroubra. And then I was working uh, daytime at, uh, in a, at a bowling club. So I was uh, doing greenkeeping and I thought, you know, turf isn't just for me. I need to do something else rather than just grow grass. Um, so then I applied for this job at the Blue Mountains Botanic Gardens and I was just, I felt so um, uh, lucky to apply for that job. Uh, so then I finished that apprenticeship and then during that apprenticeship, I was able to go out to an Aboriginal network meeting, which is like we learn more about Aboriginal culture and, and, um, and also meet other Aboriginal people, and that's where I got to meet Clarence. 
And then I, I, I was just wowed. I was wowed by you, Clarence. Oh, Still am. I was going to say, not by me, by everyone. <laughs> Is the air getting thicker in here? <laughs> uh, yeah, so then I, when, during that apprenticeship, I was like, um, I knew that other apprentices could go and travel the world and learn about a, um, a, you know, a, sp a specific species or, or a plant species, but I wanted to learn about the connection between people and plants. And I thought the best person to learn off is Clarence at the Botanic Garden in Sydney. So, so uh, yeah, I, I spent three months down here with Sydney and worked, on, worked under Clarence, and I, I learned a lot with the, the Aboriginal Education Unit and education within the Royal Botanic Gardens. And that's where I ran into uh, my current boss, uh, Phil Pettit, from the Community Greening Program as a coordinator. And, uh, and I thought, you know, what do you do? I was asking everyone what they do because I just kind of, you know, wanted to keep my heels in, in to the botanic gardens and kind of was very passionate and had that connection between people and plants. And I thought, what does Phil do? Phil says, oh, I've just come back from Wagga and, uh, and we just built, built a garden just around the corner. And, and uh, yeah, I was, on, I was on, the, on the news and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, I used to live in Wagga. That's where I used to, went, went, I went to school. So Phil said, oh, well, in a couple of months time, I'm heading back, do you want to come down? So he takes me down to, to this garden, this community garden in Wagga, and it's a, the community garden is a street away from where I used to live. So the Royal Botanic Gardens Community Greening Program is we help support social and community housing and also Aboriginal housing to create greener spaces. And, and I know from first in experience when we go to a, to a community, um, when we say we help support community and social housing and, and Aboriginal housing create greener spaces or learn more about plants, their, their first response is, can you help us grow native plants, medicinal plants? So it's like, yeah, yeah, we, yeah, we can. So there's a, a massive push for out into these Aboriginal communities to grow medicinal plants. But I always see as, as a plant as like, well, first I see them as people as well. Like plants are like people. Um, for instance, you know, with a native plant, they're strong and resilient, but if you move them, they get upset. Um, but uh, with the... So with uh, native plants, for example, is that is uh, you know I've had that connection with with um, with food. So um, I'm just starting to experiment with with utilising native native plants like lemon myrtle and 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 and, uh, and finger lime. And I made this delicious lemon myrtle um, lemon cheesecake. Not, yeah, I'm not as good as I've seen your um, your Instagram post, but um, <laughs> I think I'm a star. Thanks for sharing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And with that, we'll move on to Chris. <laughs> How do you compete with those yarns? I'm actually a ballander, and, uh, and a ballander is a segue to the story I want to tell. Mine's not going to be anywhere near as interesting, but ballander and helps us tell just, that story. Just to clarify, ballander or ballander is... Nah, let me get to the story, Clarence. You're jumping ahead, huh? I thought so, you were just going to leave them no, hanging no, all together. I'm not going to leave it hanging, because... Well, carry on. Part of the story is there is a prize at the end of the story. And uh, so I'm a ballander, and we're going to get to that story in a minute. But the first part of that yarn is Australia had an export industry about 400 years ago, which is a bit like another yarn that uh, I'll get to about what black ducks around. But who ever knew that we had this export industry going 400 years ago? Who does economics and hears about this story? Who learns about this sort of stuff and hears about the trade that goes on? And that trade was going along with trepang. So everybody's nodding their head. Of course you all know what trepang is, sea cucumber. And they were trading it with macassans. And they were trading it 400 years ago. And with that trade, up north they call white fellows ballanders because it's a derivation of Hollander. So we all keep going on and saying, geez, you know, Captain Cook and this and that. And you go, well, mobs knew a lot more white fellows up north before old mate landed here. So that's a bit of a yarn that we don't hear. And that's part of the yarn that I guess I get involved in with another story, which is the black duck story. <clears throat> and that's about a yarn that Bruce Pascoe sort of cracked a nut on. And uh, I've been lucky enough to get invited in with a bit of my story to help that business along. And we're trying to turn that big yarn that he had in Dark Emu into a social enterprise. And it's about changing 
the way we understand Australia. It's about calling out the truth, and it's about giving everybody a bit of an education. So I noticed there were a lot of heads nodding when I mentioned Trepang, but there was one nodding and putting hands up quite vigorously. So you get the Black Duck Prize. <laughs> and, and because you're follically challenged, it'll help too. <laughs> Well done, you're on board. Gates open on the farm for you every time. And I want to finish that yarn by saying water for Ewan Mob because Black Duck Foods is a Ewan social enterprise and Warami and Ghani paying respect for elders past, present and emerging and all those beautiful emerging storytellers from Gadigal country. So thanks. Clarence. Thanks, Chris. I almost stepped in there. <laughs> for the bonus prize, who has ever smelt trepang when it's being processed. You haven't missed anything, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Apparently it's a delicacy. Hmm. Just to round that out, and guess who has the licence to export trepang from Northern Australia? Is this going to be controversial? Well, it depends how you view it. Well, it's Ta not blackfellas? Uh, no, Tasmania seafood. Because yeah. they're so close. <laughs> Yeah, I should have guessed. Uh, well, we'll stay on you. The, the black duck story. You, you, you're a white fella, but you're, you're yeah, right on side with, with the black fellas and you work with social enterprise to help the community. How's that going for you? So far, so good. Probably like everybody. We started out of the drought in November 2019, went into a bushfire. The property's down near Malakuta. So we had drought, bushfire, and thought, well, that can only lead to good things, and then we had COVID. So uh, it made life interesting. And, but in all of that, uh, what we were able to still do is get a harvest out of some grains, which we were able to turn into some flour. So Black Duck Foods, I guess, has a couple different roles. One, it's about resurrecting traditional agriculture. Um, and our focus is a lot on the grains and the tuba story, so there's a real there's, there's a component of the Murnong in that, and we, the, the men in the business play a certain role in that story. The grains, obviously, we have capacity within the farm that um, Bruce Pascoe owns and, and we operate on. And then there's what we do outside of the farm, and that's telling the yarn to as many other different mobs and organisations about getting on board. And so we have a really you know, a number of strong aspirations about a shared value model. It, it's not only what we're doing on the farm, which is almost research and development in a sort of a farmer's sort of approach where we, we make a lot of mistakes and learn from them. So people don't have to follow us to make the same mistake, but it's also about using it as a place where this is, the, this is what we've tried, come down and have that yarn with us and then we'll come out to all the different country. And, COVID's made a little bit challenging how far we can get, but we've gone sort of around Victoria and, and New South Wales, sort of. And, and it's about sitting down and telling people what the possible is. Um, and also giving them heart that they do have that food story for their country. So our focus is not only um, our own, you know, neck of the woods, collaborating with you and community. And, and we operate as a social network under a you and cultural framework. So that surrounds everything we do. And then we operate as a business within that. And if we don't have that cultural licence to operate, we, we don't exist anymore. And it's that story that they've allowed us to use. We use Black Duck, the totem, um, Yumbra, and that allows us to operate. And, and we see there's a really strong connect in the way we do business and the way that culture is instilled into the business is everything part of the business and it's respected in the way we do it. And we honour the stories that we get around the food side and we honour that knowledge and we're trying to contribute back some of that as well and share that because it's, you know, my being here is a real exemplar about what this shared journey is about, that it's not an exclusive part. There's some story I don't need to know and I bring my story, which is normally the money story and the boring business story, um, but as a group we collaborate equitably because everybody in the organisation has got a strong story and it's that strength that makes us keep going a little bit stronger each day. And that actually brings me to you, Sharon, because I know the industry is such... I'm, I might get a quick show of hands. Who grows any native edibles at home? Well, well 
few people. Excellent. Yeah, I should have put my hand up too, sorry. <laughs> um, the thing that pe people, uh, you know, people always ask about natives, oh, yeah, 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 I'm going to grow, you know, um, finger limes or I'm going to grow warrigal greens or I'm going to grow muntries or whatever the, the case may be. The yield is very, very small on, on our natives. You know, back in the day, our ancestors were able to move around a lot and follow the seasons and follow everything that was able to sustain them. Um, nowadays, part of the, you know, the story is that the demand is very, very high the supply is not matching the demand, which leaves room for exploitation. But Sharon, I know you do your utmost to make sure that the communities you're dealing with are being certainly looked after in that regard. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it took me about 15 years while I was here in Sydney leading up to developing my own retail brand. And the reason that I, I developed my own retail brand was that there was very few Aboriginal owned retail brands out there. So I was wanting to, to create my own so people could buy, you know, true, authentic Aboriginal products. So establishing connections with communities across the country, from one end of the country to the other, which I, I still do have really strong connections with. And a big part of that has actually turned a little bit, Clarence, it's turned from, you know, growing and wild harvesting or you know, planting lots more to actually protecting our communities now. So a lot of our communities being exploited in ways of knowledge. Um, people going out taking knowledge for their own benefit to, to promote the selling of their own products. Um, or they're just blatantly ripping our communities off. Um, whether it's, you know, buying so many tonnes of of native produce, bringing it back to the cities, you know, buying it for $10 a kilo and selling it for $280 a kilo. So one of the families that I work a lot with in Kakadu, um, and I've spent a fair bit of time up there, you know, the, our families are so are giving, our people are so giving and, and want to share, but then not know where they need to protect ourselves in, in some cases. And I seen firsthand other people just going in and asking and taking and not even acknowledging, not even paying that respect to our people and then using it to, to using their story to sell their products. But that's one thing that I'm very, very big on is, you know, if I can't get my fruit from Aboriginal growers. I just won't produce it. I'll refuse to just buy the fruits elsewhere and, and produce that product for that season. And I think that's a, uh, yeah, across the board, if you at uh, the viewers at home or the people here, if you'd like to uh, have a look at Aboriginal plants and IP, cultural IP and patents, there are currently patents on so many of our native foods, it is not funny. And it's, it's, it is it's quite uh, scary to think where that might be. And as Sharon said, it's, our people are very, very giving. Um, and Brendan, you've, uh, you yourself have given quite a bit. You can follow Brendan and the community greening team on your preferred social media handles of Twitter, Instagram, or just Twitter, I see, I see you on Twitter all the time, but, but just some of the, the gardens that they, they are doing in communities. What, uh, what's up some of the, your favourite plants and favourite communities to visit when you, uh, when you help in, the, in this regard? Favourite plants? Well, obviously it's the, you know, for this evening's theme would be native plants, but I love all food. <laughs> Don't we all? <laughs> Um, but yeah, our, sorry, our social media is um, Community Greening New South Wales uh, on Facebook. We're also on Instagram and, and Twitter. Um, and sorry, I forgot the question, Clarence. Well, we know he your favourite plant is food. <laughs> but <laughs> some, of the, some of your favourite uh, communities that you visited and, and, and uh, helped establish community gardens. Oh, I, I, there's so many, I know. That's, that's a hard one because the, the Community Greening program, you know, we work across the whole state of New South Wales. So, like, one week we'll be in Wilcannia, next week we'll be in Wollongong, the week after that we'll be in Dubbo, and then also maybe out in Gonia. So we're just... 
It's everywhere, but, you know, I really, when I first started with community greening, I was so keen to head out west. I was so keen to head out bush, and that's where I found my connection. But it was more um, the people, and it was and how, we, how people can interact with, with plants. And because um, I wanted to, I've had that experience here in the Botanic Garden, so I wanted, um, you know, that traditional learning to bring back to life and to having our, um, our rural communities having that connection to plants, whether if it's a, um, you know, an introduced species of, of food or even if it's a, um, a medicinal or, or native food or native medicine or something to make a tool or, or weapon with um, or shelter. Um, but my favourite native plant would have to be a xanthorea grass tree. Good answer. <laughs> Why? Why is it your favourite? Um, I just feel like as if, you know, I feel like I see myself as a grass tree. Um, but not in what we, what it used to be called. Um, I see it as a, a strong plant as it stands, it stands tall. Um, and when it, you know, when it grows, you can see the, the formation that this tree makes of producing a, just one standalone flower and it's kind of, you know, it stands out, but, um, you know, but it's kind of like, you know, it, it's everywhere, and, and it's kind of like we're, uh, you know, it's on our, it's on our currency, it's on a two-dollar coin. Um, but I just love the, love the flower. I love the, you know, the, um, the floristry you can make with the, with the tree, but also the Aboriginal uses that come out of that plant, and then how to connect that plant with, with, um, with people. And one of those plants, the, the xanthorea, you can also purchase at um, a Aboriginal nursery called Indigigrow out in La Perouse. And black duck may not be growing black, uh, black duck. <laughs> <laughs> I nearly, that's what nearly slipped up. Uh, black duck may not be growing grass trees, but um, how do you involve the community when it comes to uh, some of the plants you are growing down there on the farm? And, and you know, getting, I know you've got plenty of yarns, but the more yeah. the, uh, you know, I guess the, the different types of plants and the, and the upskilling. Yeah, I mean, we, we're fortunate we have um, Uncle Noel Butler on the board. So besides... Jack and Bruce Pascoe, you know, Noel brings a quantum of knowledge. I guess the first step we involve the community is by, we involve them by asking to get that licence to operate. So it's, it's, they have the control over whether we do business. Another way we engage with the community is actually employ them. So, you know, it's, it's paramount that we have majority Indigenous board and majority Yuan board. Workforce is majority you and people, and that's how we engage with the community. And then it's about how we look at spreading that story and supporting that story. So there's a real Murnong story down that way, and what we're working with is um, some women's groups to actually bring that back. And and our role is not to harvest and take the women's story from the Murnong, but to to do what the white-footed rabbit rat did until it was made extinct, is that we look after and tend the soil and grow the seeds so we can hand that back. So it's about fostering that yarns amongst people that have been disconnected from those stories. So it's also about bringing them in to taste it, because there's nothing better when we're either on the farm or we go out. We are up in Gamilaroi country middle of last year um, for sort of a Johnny Cake day, and all the old aunties came out and basically all that food story just started happening organically and it was brilliant. And what it made people realise is that's a story that comes from that country. And, you know, we're Adjuri Mob, I tell you, they're the grain people and they've got 40 different words for grass. So you're telling... What, it, what it's about is opening up people's... Um, or rekindling their knowledge and that yarn that must exist in their community and, and helping them go search for that. And just like everybody's mentioned, there's this sort of notion that supply is a big issue. It is until we've healed enough country because that grass story used to be 40% of the land mass. You know, we've all seen the Tyndale arc. So hang on, that's an aspirational target. Why aren't we going back to that? And even if we took out 5% of the wheat market with native grains, that's a still a fairly hefty industry. So that's, that's our yarn too. So you know, favourite foods, it's the ones that cover the landscape. It's the ones that go from one country to another and it doesn't have to be a particular one because they all taste beautiful in their own special way. But they all come with their own st story, they all come with their own language. 
And so this is a great opportunity to talk about, you know, building that asset back up. Um, you know, and in that, once you get the grasses growing, you've got all those other herbaceous plants and, you know, all the murnong and all that sort of stuff comes up and then everybody can get out. So, uh, you know, on the farm, you know, we, the community is like it's, it's part of the country. You know, we couldn't be on country without community and, you know, we wouldn't be on the country without community support. Well, I might take the time to uh, say hello to Uncle Noel Butler. He's one of my mentors and you know, absolutely champion man. Uh, he and Arnie Trish have... Uh, you can check, his, check out a story. You can use your preferred search engine on the internet thing. <laughs> Noel Butler, Reveg, bushfire. Prior, he still hasn't built his house. He just started planting all over his property because the animals had nothing to eat. He said, I can live anywhere. These fellas all need a feed, so that's the kind of man he is. It's almost making me tear up because I was down there uh, looking at the, what's happening after the bushfires and it's taking a long time for that to come back. Um, but hopefully, you know, we uh, have about 60,000 years of you know, looking after the land. Hopefully, you know, bureaucracy might see the light. Ah! All right. So, next question. Thinking about native plants that you use in your activity, because you didn't answer this properly, Brendan... Which plants would you recommend for the home gardener? Oh, so I did a bit of a YouTube, um, a YouTube segment for... Just answer the question? Just not answer not the, question, the one Brendan. with the PVC pipe, was it? No, 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 no. <laughs> we won't talk about that here. Um, so it was, a, it was a segment on... A, uh, it was from a link from the Botanic Gardens into uh, you know, what, it, what can you plant or what do you have in your home garden as a native plant? Um, and there's a variety of, of different native plants that are very successful on the balcony or at home, um, from your ground covers from Warrigal Greens to your grasses like um, Lamandra, uh, Grevillea as a shrub, and then um, I'd go with the Western Australian flowering gum for a bit of texture, I think. That's a very good answer. How about you, Sharon? You're, you're out there in that. It's a little bit cooler where you are. It is. It's cooled down a bit in Mudgee at the moment. Um, I know I've recently just planted 200 native thyme plants, 200 river mint from Indigigrow. Um, but I, I know I've got some succulents growing that I like, like to be growing stuff that I can use in the cafe and for our dining experiences as well. So smaller growing herbs and things that we can just pick and use straight away. And they're, they're so easy to look after. They don't need much attention. <laughs> so you can, they're quite easy to grow and you can be using them fresh or dried. Um, so yeah. And I, I will say, I'll, I'll give my own business a plug here. Um, my team have been doing quite a bit with native grasses and people kind of get lost in the whole flowering business. They'd, oh, you know, it's got to look good, it's got to be... Oh, that flowers are overrated sometimes. I love them too, don't get me wrong. But the texture of some of our native grasses is unbelievable. And you know, as Chris mentioned, the, the thematas in particular, um, you know, we've been growing yam daisies, the murnong that Chris mentioned, and they'll self-seed. And it, if you put enough of them in, you don't have to weed. We can get on top of this weed problem. Weeds in Australia are costing the economy billions of dollars. Chris, what do you say about that? I, I couldn't agree more. For somebody who doesn't have it, you know, I don't have a sense of growing things. You know, I'm out there to, to do something else. But I could tell you, one of the best things is to work with the country you've got. So what, what are the species that are endemic to that country? Because Mother Earth's been battered around already for the last 250 years. Putting something that doesn't belong in country just hurts probably a little bit more. So there's a real sort of, from our perspective, we're just trying to put back what should be there. And, and what's been amazing is destocking the farm and just seeing what native grasses do come out. Thematur is ubiquitous. And once you've seen it, the kangaroo grass, you see it everywhere. And it's a wonderful grass and uh, you know, there's, there's great opportunities, and not only the textures, but the tastes. And there's a whole lot of big story with all these other grasses that are out there. I think the opportunity is we start looking at our gardens as our food bowls. We start looking at our environment as a farm. You know, there's, there's a, a colonial construct that says agriculture, environment. That's before 
but it started, must start with country, which is all of those sorts of things. And it, it, it mixes in. So all these beautiful things are also great to eat. All these amazing medicinal plants also tell you something's going on in the climate. That's not my yarn, but mine is, it's about that knowledge we don't know because we never opened our ears to it, we never saw it, and there's an opportunity to engage with it because it's, it's there. And understanding that story of what you're going to plant, understanding the language that comes with it, that's amazing, that's really enriching, and that's the bit I get out of every time I get down on the farm is there's always something new, there's always a new yarn, and you know, there's always something popping up that they've just found somewhere. And it's been amazing. The rains and the fires have given us probably, you know, opportunity to get out there and see and find more, but it's all coming from country. And so that's, you know, for, for us, you and country is where we're trying to grow you and food, but that's, that yarn can happen in any country. Well said. And there's something there for everyone. You can have a look at a seasonal calendar you can have a look at, you know, what grows in the arid zones, what grows in the temperate climate. The, it's, you know, we do grow um, macadamia nuts down here. And, you know, but the southerly buster often comes through and, you know, the proliferation of flowers and then, bang, the southerly buster comes and they don't get a chance to pollinate, so you end up with about three macadamia nuts. <laughs> it's very sad. But, you know, it's horses for courses, as Chris said. Um, we are getting you know, tight on time because we want to try and take some questions uh, from the end. So really quickly, how do we get in touch with Indigi Earth? That name again, Indigi Earth. Um, website, indigieearth.com.au. Um, we're now based in Mudgee. Um, do everything from Mudgee. I also opened a cafe and a dining experience in Mudgee in the middle of a pandemic. So, some things that I just do really stupid, but it worked. Um, I've always, from 25 years ago, I've always been one to go against the grain. Nobody can tell me not to do anything. Um, so yes, seven months ago I started a cafe. It's called Warakiri by Indigia. So Warakiri means to grow, not to grow that way from food, but to grow in spirit with us and in culture. So our dining experience is a five course degustation and I've incorporated lots of culture with that as well. So, and I talk about all the native ingredients, where it comes from, how it was used traditionally, what it was used for, medicinal benefits. My son plays the didge. We do a little bit of dancing. Um, storytelling and we've in a very short period of time we've been listed by in the top 100 places to eat by good food in, within seven months so, yes. and I think we're one of only a handful of Aboriginal owned business that are doing that kind of dining and experience in New South Wales actually on the whole east coast of Australia now that poor old Jabakai has closed down. But doing things in, in community, on community, is something that I'm still very passionate about. I was in Gaira a couple of weeks ago working with community on with an amazing program that they have up there with Indigenous rangers, their own funding, their own land, and they want to get into to growing. And one of the biggest things that I'm passionate about is just growing what's traditional to country. We have so many native plants and species out there that everyone, all of our communities can have a piece of the pie if we're all looking after Mother Earth first. We put Ganithikun first, she will provide back to us and everyone's just growing what's traditional to country. We can all share and we can all benefit from that. And ladies and gentlemen, www.indigieearth.com.au, a fabulous range of beauty products. <laughs> <laughs> and community greening, Brendan. Hundreds and hundreds of community gardens established across New South Wales. How do we get in touch? Uh, Facebook, Community Greening New South Wales. Also on the Royal Botanic Gardens Sydney uh, web website. You can type into Google, Community Greening Program, and uh, we'll pop up. 
Chris, Black Duck. Uh, blackduckfoods.org. Um, and then you can send an email to info at blackduckfoods.org. I think there's a phone number down. It all comes to me, you know. I'm chief cook oh. bottle washer. Uh, so don't, don't get a speedy, you won't get a speedy response, but I will give you a response. And you can look us up on Instagram, um, and much to the amusement of my children, I currently run it to the point where I'm now in a position where I've found somebody that actually knows what's going on, and they will start posting something a little bit more energetically. But that's where we exist. We, you know, we would love to say we're everywhere, but we're just getting on with the growing bit and the yarning bit, and then we're going to probably get out there and tell our story a bit more. But fortunately, Bruce is out there telling it pretty well to start with, so we don't need to concentrate too much on the yarn. Um, we just got to get the work done. Can I just add? Yes. Looks like it'll be this... Well, Bruce is coming out to Mudgee, so I've known Bruce a long time and done a fair bit of work with him. So if you want to come to Mudgee, 17th of... July we're looking at and we're going to be doing a weekend of talks. We're going to do a dinner, one of my dinner experiences. But the aim of it is to help get local farmers in to learn about traditional land management, all the, the vineyard growers, them people, that just how to, to look after the land, how to read the land, how to heal. Um, so we're going to, Bruce, We've been trying to do something for a while, so Bruce is coming out in, in July. And we also, I think I've roped Diego into coming as well. Yeah, yeah. So Diego's going to come and participate as well. Oh, a special hello to Diego yeah. Bonetto, everybody, the weedy man. I know. Diego. If you get a chance to do a workshop with Diego, yep. have you got any coming up, Diego? All the time, yes. All the time, that's good. <laughs> Yeah, Diego Bonetta, check it out. It's yeah. unbelievable. Foraging workshops all over Sydney. What weed is that? Can I eat that weed? He'll tell you. Yep. Yeah. Um, we haven't got anywhere near enough time to even touch the surface on this subject, but Phil, we've got a few questions. Yeah, we've got a question from Facebook from Nick Rose. So, how important is First Nations land management, revegetation, and Indigenous food sovereignty to dealing with the climate emergency of catastrophic fires and extreme floods? Can each, how, each how of us answer that in 30 seconds? Yeah. How much time have we got? Very important. I mean, it, it, it's integral to it. I mean, it, we've got to the point where we are because of willful damage, and that willful damage is either through ignorance or it's just been arrogance. Well said. And we're at a point where we need to stop and think of the systems that we've got going and stop this split between environment and agriculture, splitting up and having a, a, a fighting mentality with, with country. But in saying that, the other thing we can't say is, oh, traditional knowledge, that's going to be the panacea for 250 years of damage. Because that's just hijacking another story. And, we've, and First Nations people get less than 1% of the food story, they get less than 1% of the water story, less than 1% of a whole lot of stories, but they get 100% of theft of their story. And this is not a black fella problem, this is a white fella stealing problem. And we can't keep stealing if we're going to start attacking and if we're going to start meeting the challenge the climate face puts us out. So this is not something where we go hijack and steal some more knowledge to go solve. It's something that we start learning a bit of respect and come to it as white fellas to actually start doing it proper like. Dare I say, can't keep stealing if we want to start healing. True story. Sharon? Yeah, look, I think what we're talking about here is bigger than all of us. It's, it's much bigger than any of us and what we're, we're dealing with, with healing and putting back, if we don't start to, to do the right thing, we have no control because this is bigger than all of us. Well, that's a global issue. So I think that, you know, that we all need to uh, have, have the, same, the same movement in the same way and with the, like we're not really, you know, as you say, Chris, not listening to each other. You know, it's just um, we're all, there's one, one party's pulling, the other one's pulling as well, and we're just kind of not really getting anywhere together. Yeah, and I think, yeah, people 
see that the problem is so big, so as they, what can I do as an individual? Well, we can do our, if you do your bit, your little bit will add up to a lot if everyone does something. So, you know, if we all planted one tree, you know, this is about 24 million people in Australia now, so you take out the little kids, you can help the little ones, just not the really little ones, help the little ones to plant one, millions of trees. You know, I reckon I did about a thousand plants last year, where had you go? Oh, I've... More, I think. <laughs> I did more. <laughs> Bring them more. Each garden's got about a thousand. Sharon did 400 last week. Yes. We, we would just ask if you can plant them a little bit further apart. Recreate the grassy woodland that used to be here. That's all. Fill it up. Yeah. Any questions from the audience? Going once. Hang on a sec. We're live streaming. Grasses that you've got. Is somebody processing them to make them into flour? or a usable product to make breads and things? Yep, so we are. So we're, that's a whole sort of other part of the process. So what we're trying to do is the whole process side from harvesting and reimagining what the harvesting would look like in, you know, on a broader scale of a multi-species mix of grains to the processing and cleaning of those grains to get them to food grade to then mill. And we've been collaborating with an organic stone mill down in Berrigan Shout out to Woodstock Flower. They've been an amazing support and very generous and, and have, you know, an aligned soul that we have. So we've taken it to flour to then to bake with. And so that's sort of the production line, but there's a whole lot of other challenges connected to that, like Food Safety Act. In Australia, traditional foods are called novel. They've only been around I don't know, what, 65,000, 100,000 years? No, they're novel. In New Zealand, and I'm sick and tired of talking about New Zealand, you know, but in New Zealand, because of the treaty, they recognise Maori culture and they recognise traditional foods. And we have Food Safety Australia New Zealand, but we have two different acts. So when we talk about sort of system change, that's one of the things we're talking about that traditional foods need to be on their own act, that stories need to be connected to those foods to enable you to process them. And that is a lot of way of helping stop the theft, because if it's not connected to a story, it shouldn't be sold. It's not safe to sell. So that's the long yarn to your question. But it, yes, we've gone soup to nuts, so to speak, with the flowers, and we're having a look sort of similar to some of the other tubers as well. And I'm doing experimenting in the kitchen with flowers. So I've been playing around with a few different things to develop some recipes and things like that as well. Yeah, we're not as good a cook, so we're limited on what we can do. And do you have a set mill that's only uh, structured to process grasses? Like you said before, if you take 5% of wheat out of the picture yeah. and put 5% of um, native grasses in... Yeah, so the grasses are the grains, so yeah. wheat's a grass. So we, we use a stone mill, same yeah. as they grind spelt and other wheat. So we're using the same sort of grain process because we're just... Yeah. it's at, Native grass has produced just a slightly different grain. And they, 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 wheat's had a 1,000 years of technological development. Native grains, we're just in the catch-up phase. Well, my husband um, is in ownership of a mill in Tamworth and I just wondered if you can only have... Like, we process all sorts of grains up there, chickpeas and all sorts of unusual um, things to make flour. And would you have to have a mill that only does grasses? Like, your if, if you wanted, grasses. If you wanted to sell it gluten-free. Uh, so, native grasses aren't wheat, so gluten-free. So the celiacs are on the phone to us every day. But, um, so if you, wanted a, if you wanted a dedicated system for that sort of thing, that, that's the only... Because you can alter and modify most things, and that's what we do. You know, we, we've altered, modified, tinkered, and got some pretty handy results. Oh, we've got a quick one. We're starting to go over time. Sorry, a very ask quick question. one. You were talking about some suggestions of things that we could grow, like in our gardens. You know, um, we've got small units sort of style gardens, but I'd love to grow something where you could actually eat something, you know, rather than just look at it. Is there something you could grow here that you could, you know, eat 
berries or something from it? Yeah, so I think it was uh, maybe three of those plants I mentioned you could eat. I just didn't mention that you could eat them. Oh, the flowering gum. <laughs> You so can... not the flowering gum, but oh. that's a beautiful art project you can make um, make Aboriginal artwork with, um, and that with the calisthen seed, but the calisthen flower you can use to um, take the nectar from. But the grevillea that I mentioned, same thing with the nectar. Uh, Lamandra, the base of the plant, you can either taste like a, a, a bean or, or celery, um, but also the seed was grinded up to make into a, in, into a flower. Um, and the warrigal greens make an amazing pesto. Mm. Yeah. Just Thank be careful you. of the oxalic acid. Because the oxalates can calcify in your bloodstream, causing kidney stones. It's been a message from New South Wales Health, Britain, authorised by Clara Stock. <laughs> I just want to um, just respond to that, and then I just want to make a comment generally. Um, it, lily, lily pillies grow on practically every footpath in Sydney, and they're coming into season right now, particularly the purple lily pilly. You know, we know that country women in Australia um, make lily pilly jam for centuries, and obviously Aboriginal folk ate lily pillies way before then as well. So never forget that the lily pilly is there, and I know case of course foraging, I recommend you forage off the lily pilly trees because they just go to waste otherwise. The other comment I want to make, and I know we're talking about plants, um, is one thing we forget about bush tucker as a definition is that I bet everybody here, or virtually everybody here, eats oysters, fish, crabs, all right? We never define that as bush tucker, and yet that was a substantial part of the diet of every coastal Aboriginal nation. And I think you want to, I want you to reflect on why do we only talk about bush tucker as the kind of stuff that is alien, whereas because fish didn't look alien, we never, call them bush tucker. We never particularised them, we never kind of alienated them. Just think about that and, and rethink about the whole scope of what bush tucker actually means. We are at the Royal Botanic Gardens, we aren't at the aquarium, but that's okay. I, I get what you're saying. <laughs> yes, one more. Um, how can we support indigenous people to actually run indigenous and have their own business rather than as non-Indigenous people appropriate um, Indigenous business? Well, I think you can get in touch with uh, Chris for that uh, beautiful collaboration between uh, you know, what, what is achievable as uh, you know, a broader group. Um, I'm 100% uh, Aboriginal-owned business, Sharon's 100% Abor Aboriginal-owned business, and it is tough, and it, especially the last 12 months has been really difficult, but um, Chris mentioned it earlier, the, the difficulty for the green space, and, and particularly if you're working in plants, had a drought followed by a bushfire, followed by a pandemic. The pandemic, everyone wanted plants. You couldn't get the seeds because of the drought and then the bushfire. You couldn't, the nurseries are just scrambling to try and grow the plants that you need. And then you know, the native plant industry in particular, it's the chicken and egg. If people want to grow the plants, but they can't get the plants because the nurseries aren't growing the plants. The nurseries aren't growing the plants because people aren't asking for the plants. And the people aren't asking for the plants because the nurseries aren't growing the plants. Do you see what's happening? Hmm. But to support business, um, people are asking, people, I've noticed people are starting to ask questions about are you Aboriginal owned business or if you're not, how are you supporting Aboriginal enterprise? How are you? And it's okay to ask those questions because most people, I say most, most people who are in business selling native ingredients or native skincare or whatever it is, they may have a genuine connection or they may have an employment program or something. So it's okay to ask those questions to people if you want to buy from that particular business. And that's how you can support Aboriginal business. Yeah, we've got one more question at the back there. Sorry guys, I'll make it brief. Um, I'm not too sure if you guys know anything about mycelium and what um, biologists and scientists are finding out about mycelium and everything around the world. But in terms of bush regeneration, what do we know or what can we you know, um, what can we, you know, garnish from knowledge about um, bush fungi? I love the mycelial network. <laughs> if you've got, if you got a chance, check out a, a, a UK mycologist. He's got the coolest name ever, Melvin Sheldrake. 
But yeah, look, um, a lot of our elders used, used uh, a lot of the, the um, bracken fungi and quite a few fungis as, as medicinal. Um, yeah, the, that mycelial network and the microbial networks, everything that's under the ground is the bit that a lot of people sort of fail to recognise when it comes to the biodiversity and you know, certainly the eco ecologies in the bush um, and the, how hot the bushfires burnt last summer. Last summer? Mm. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's had a massive impact. As I said, I was just down there just looking at how the bush has re well, hasn't really recovered. What's happened this time around, because it was so hot, it's... It, it's very sad. I think that the segue to that in those systems is for us to realise Australia's soils used to be this beautiful metre deep mulch and now we're trying to grow things and walk on things effectively on porcelain. So understanding all these systems, we've actually got to relearn what to do in a, in a really deplete environment until we can heal and restore that soil story to get it back up and thrive again. And it's those sorts of holding onto those yarns and that knowledge of what's going on under the ground is really, really vital until we can get to those points. And, and that's part of the experimentation. It's part of, you know, what are the food systems gonna do to help that? It's part of the fire story. It's part of all these sort of connected holistic thinking that it's about bringing that together. And again, it's, it's not about trying to push these things apart. It's actually how do we put it all together and First Nations people have got that notion of country. That's all we need to talk about because it brings all that together. Now, I know we're way over time because we've got time for networking and we've got some canapes from Goanna Hut that you need to have a try of because we are going to have some bush tucker. There might be some fish. I don't know. <laughs> but um, I certainly want to thank the panel, but I also want to just get a quick... Uh, 30 to 60 second, uh, you know, what can we look forward to in the future, um, you know, if we all perhaps do a little better? I think looking after each other is really important. Um, sharing each other, sharing culture, sharing knowledge, but respecting that in the process and um, just looking after Mother Earth. I think that uh, you know, if you've got uh, a little bit of land or a backyard or front yard to work with and you want to turn it into a native garden where you don't have to uh, fertilise and overwater, is utilise what you've got. Rather than taking it away and replacing it with something that looks good, that front yard is potentially, if it's got a few native trees in it, you want to add a few um, shrubs and grasses, ground cover, just, just work with what you've got rather than introducing your, your ground because you've already got it there. Future should be getting your Winnebago, as the grey nomad, going 50 k's up the road, having a slice of bread that comes with language story from that country, getting back in again, go another 50 k's up the road, have another scone, new language, new flower system, new food story, and then go another 50. And, and here, the amazing food trail that Australia has, because we've got hundreds of languages, we've got thousands of stories We've got the original food, food trail, and yet none of us get in a car and go enjoy it. So I'm waiting to go grey and uh, get a Winnebago, and then that's, that's my dream. So we, we shouldn't be too far off. Oh, once again, everybody, uh, can we thank our panel? I would certainly like to echo their sentiments. We do need to look after each other. We do look at, need to look after our beautiful Earth Mother. If we can get out there, help in some way, meet Aboriginal people, meet Torres Strait Islander people, meet somebody from another culture. Yes. You know, expand your circle of friends <laughs> at a COVIDly safe distance. <laughs> <laughs> um, which brings me to your exit this evening will be via the Moors Head Fountain Gate which you will go out of the calyx and you'll go up the hill. Is it lit, Phil? So, yeah. Yeah. So you will, it's literally opposite the library. So there's a, a large fountain. Well, it's probably not even on, but it's a big circular fountain with steel bars. And it looks like a flower almost. But anyway, Morsehead Fountain Gate for exits. There will be canapes from Goanna Hut. Uh,
Dear Violet are coming back to entertain you with some more beautiful music. The live stream is no longer live. Still live. Oh, well. For those of you who are still tuned in, sorry it's taken us so long. We, as I said, we only scratched the surface. There's so much that we uh, could have touched on and, you know, we really... Uh, we're, we're still here, as uh, one of the old uncles from LARPA says. Um, yeah, there's BC and, yeah, before Cook, and then, yeah, and then there, oh, now there's now. But um, <laughs> we, uh, yeah, we have, uh, we've come a long way, but we certainly have a long way to go. And working with Aboriginal people, learning how to step lightly, how to, you know, really look after country, I think we can all learn so much. I can certainly still learn a lot, even though I... You know, seem to know a bit. I'm, again, I only know about this much. There's so much to learn. And you know, we are sharing people. So enjoy the rest of the evening and get out and enjoy this beautiful country and look after it, please.